welcome to another episode of the No Students Podcast. I'm Tyler Metcalf, joined as always by Tyler Rucker. Rucker, two weeks away. How are we doing? Two weeks, baby. Um, I'm doing okay. Um, lack of sleep all, at an all-time high. You know, I feel like when we get to this point of the year, I quickly realize like, oh, okay, I actually need another week. As excited as I've been, I'm like, okay, we've got a lot of stuff I need to pump out. But I'm excited. Um, really thrilled to be doing another episode with you, Metcalf. There's a lot of buzz around the air these days. There's a lot of names making some noise. So I'm excited to talk about it. And as always, do another episode with you. How are we doing, Metcalf? How are we holding up? Doing fantastic. I mean, it's wild that we're two weeks away um, in terms of content and, you know, stuff that we want to get out there. An extra week would be phenomenal. Um, but an extra week of grinding tape uh, would probably just lead me to a lot more overthinking like I did a couple of years ago uh, yep. when, when COVID hit. That just magical takes came out of that year. Um, but uh, in, in, listeners, in case you missed it or if you're new to the show, welcome. Um, our draft guide is live over at noceilingsnba.com. Uh, Along with all of our written work, it's free Monday through Friday. The draft guide is 10 bucks if you can afford it. Uh, it would mean the world to us if you'd check it out. Um, so please go there, check it out. But today's episode, we are going to be running through and reacting to our eighth version of the No, of the no Ceilings Composite Big Board, uh, one through 60. Um, we're just going to kind of touch on everyone, things we liked, things we didn't like. Uh, for the first round, we'll just go through five names at a time go a little wider and more rapid fire in the second round. But with the top five picks or not top five picks, I, I need to be clear about that because again, this is a big board, not a mock draft, two very different things. So the top five rankings, um, starting at one, Victor Wembanyama, two, Scoot Henderson, three, Brandon Miller, four, Jairus Walker, five, Cam Whitmore. Um, I don't think there's a whole lot of movement here at all, but from the last couple, uh, was anything kind of stood out to you here? No, I, I think this is, I you know, we're going to have, for everyone listening, we're going to have one more update. Um, odds are that's probably going to be the week of the draft. So we're at the point of the year right now where I'd be shocked for a ton of movement. I think especially with our no ceilings crew, I think if it's anything, it's going to be a name move in maybe one or two spots, but everyone's pretty set on the guys. And, you know, we've got that last deadline coming up for international players, but I don't think too much is going to move. Um the top five, I think, is going to be what the next edition will be, too. I think that's pretty much set right now. I think there's a chance, you know, those names go in some order, maybe not entirely, but I think a lot of those names are going to be the top five picks. Um, Whitmore's buzzing right now. Um, everything you've heard is he's looked fantastic in workouts. I think a lot of teams are trying to figure out a way to come get Cam Whitmore. But the problem is, is a lot of teams that have the shot to pick him are not wanting to trade out of that spot. Because I think when you get past Victor Scoot and Brandon Miller, you're probably looking at Whitmore as maybe one of the biggest high upside guys. Obviously, Amen Thompson's in that conversation too, but we'll have plenty of words on that. So um, not surprising to me, Metcalf, you? No, this is this mirrors my top five. Exactly. Mm -hmm, me too. Um, Cam Whitmore is the one, like you're saying, based on these pre-draft workouts, who is really impressing people right now. And when you look at what his game is, I don't think that should be surprising at all. I mean, he's a freak athlete once you get him up close and personal, um, and you can really witness that power and athleticism uh, up close. I, I can understand why it's impressing a lot of people, especially if the shot is kind of coming around too. I don't think any of the individual areas of his game in terms of scoring or athleticism are really that big of a question for people. The my my big question with him still remains is what is he in that team context and that lack of playmaking, the lack of feel, the questionable or inconsistent off-ball defense. How is that really going to translate to the next level? I think there's star upside there. I think there's, you know, number 2 option on a really really good team potential there. But are you worried at all about those that the, the more team centric um, and, you know, those skills really developing and him kind of breaking out of his individual silo? You know, I, I still think I've been one of the guys throughout the entire year for no ceiling that's been higher on Cam Whitmore. I, I still see a, a platform for his ability to reach where it's like things are really cooking. 
Um, I've gone back and forth with the idea of him going to somewhere in like Detroit and do I like that fit? I, I think that's the point of the draft. If you're getting someone like Cam Whitmore at five and we have him fifth on our board, but just, you know, speaking out loud right now, I think that's too much intriguing upside when you're putting Ivy Cunningham and, and Cam Whitmore together. That's some real serious firepower to groom with. And obviously Jalen Duran's going to be holding it down in the middle. I'm not too worried. I, I think that Villanova team was probably a worse situation than some people might realize. And it's just, it's a tough spot. You know, the first year after Jay Wright, all that stuff, Whitmore kind of had that thumb injury in the beginning of the year, had the delayed start and second half of the season, he was really looking like what we thought he was going to be. So um, if he's in present in these workouts, the shots coming along, I think there's there's room for him to really surprise early on. And I think it's going to take some time, but I think what he projects to be at the NBA level, if you can get that with the fifth pick, you're probably going to be, you know, running into the podium. All right. Uh, moving on at six, we had Asar Thompson, seven, we had Amen Thompson, eight, we had Taylor Hendricks, nine, Anthony Black, 10, Keontae George. I had these names all in a different order, but these were the names I had. So I, I'm not too surprised to, to see it. I think personally, my big adjustment was I had moved Hendricks above the Thompson twins. Um, I had a SAR and a men at seven and eight. Everyone's going to kind of overreact to that and be a little bit like, what are you talking about? And you think we're crazy? Go look this morning. Jeremy Wu and Jonathan Gavoni posted a thing and they said as, as much as a men Thompson has sensational upside and we've said that at no ceilings yep. all year he said this could be the guy that goes for a little bit of a tumble on draft night if he doesn't go forth to houston i still think from everything i've heard houston is enamored with the thompson twins both of them i think that'd be a great fit for both parties um but i think if he doesn't go there there's chances he could go a little bit later than some might be expecting so um, what did you think, Metcalf? I mean, were you surprised? Do you think it's it kind of makes sense with how the consensus big board at no ceilings turned out with the Thompson Twins still up there in the top 10? Obviously, everyone's going to be like, what are you talking Work with us, people. There's some people, it's a consensus. So some people have them lower, some people had them high. Um, it's just interesting for me. And, and I'm one of those people that had them lower. Um, I don't have them in my top 10. And I know that's blasphemy to the vast majority of people. I get that. I see the upside. I just think they're for them to reach that potential that everyone keeps putting on them, people are treating it like a guarantee that they're going to hit that outcome. And I, th I think it's a huge question. And I think where they land is really going to be a big determinant in that. You know, if, if a man goes to Houston, let's say, you know, if I did a post-draft big board, he'd probably move up a handful of spots because I really like that fit for him. If he goes to Orlando, I don't like that at all. Like I, yeah, the the size and the athleticism and, and playmaking would be fun, but he's not helping their shooting or offensive situation really at all. Um, so I just worry about how realistic it is for them to hit those outcomes. I think their at-rim finishing gets overblown. I, you know, I think their playmaking is good but again gets overblown their defensive inconsistency is all over the place i know i sound like a, a hater right now and i don't mean to i just think that their range of outcomes is so significant that there are just a lot of other guys that i would be more eager to kind of build my team around i i mean I, amends the one name i'm the most fascinated to see where he ends up because i'm right there with you i think the fit could swing everything for it, how i feel um, as possible, I think we're all it's all warranted right now to have some concerns. I still think he's such a special talent that he's going to figure it out and all the intangibles, everything I've heard about him is fantastic. Um, yeah. And he's still an absolute freak of nature when it comes to his athleticism and talented passer with good size. A lot of things are going to check the boxes that yes. prove he could latch on and stay with a lengthy career at the NBA level. You know, Houston, um, off the top of my head, Washington and Utah are just three teams I would love for him to somehow end up on. Other teams, it it just seems like it gets a little tricky. And maybe they draft him and those teams make some moves and things clear up a little bit. But like Orlando, 
it's exciting, but that's still not helping the shooting. And maybe they, you know, there's rumors that Orlando's trying to package six and 11 to try to go up to get someone. Maybe then they try to make some moves to clear that roster up or you never know. I still like Orlando, but specifically drafting a shooter, but we'll see. Yeah. Yeah, And I, obviously if Orlando does make that, then, you know, there's probably more movement around the guards that they already have. And maybe that brings in a, a shooter that kind of helps space the floor for them. So obviously all of these things are interwoven with each other. I'm just, I want to be wrong. I'm preparing to be wrong on them. I just don't think it's this guarantee that a lot of people are making them out to be um, regarding Taylor Hendricks and Anthony black, Keontae George. Um, I have all of them in this range to Taylor Hendricks at six black at eight Keontae at nine. Um, I recently dropped Keontae a couple spots, but he's been in my top nine all season and I don't see him really going any lower than that. Anything on those three guys? The only one I'm a little surprised on, I, I just felt Anthony black was going to get a little bit of, momentum from our no ceilings crew i don't know why i just thought some people were going to get hot on on the trail he's still at you know nine um he's a name i it would not shock me on draft night if he goes you know sixth somehow or if he just goes much earlier than everyone's ready for because i think the size the tools he has to already bring to the table I think that outside shot's going to come along. Um, I just posted a piece at no com about Anthony Black comparing him to these plus size playmakers who have come into the league mm-hmm. and it's re- and gone in the lottery. And it's really impressive when you look at like the recent history. I think I went back to 2017 and it's like Josh Giddy, LaMelo Ball, Alonzo Ball. Um, you know, it, it's some, some big names. And I think Anthony Black's going to be that next wave. So, um, I know we had him at nine. I think that's fine. It's just, it's tough this time of the year to get some some movement and get ahead of some people. So that's all I got. And I'm right there with you with Conte. I still had him. Um, I still had him in my top 10 as well. I love him. Um, so, I mean, we, we kind of keep mentioning a men to Houston and how much we like that fit. And, and we do. But why wouldn't the argument be Anthony Black at that spot instead? I think that's the the curveball. Now I'm not reporting any buzz or anything, so everyone just calm down with jumping on comments on YouTube. But I think that's the curveball that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, I, I mentioned it to you before the air. I said there was before we went on the air, and I, I kind of said, "Well, you, there was a buzz about Orlando trying to go six and eleven to go up to get someone," and I was like, well, "Why wouldn't Houston just shock everyone and?" move down to six and take someone like Anthony black and maybe get 11 and then go get another piece in your rotation. I was like, that makes, you could look like a genius if you did that. And and maybe you move down to six and get somebody else. But you know, Jeremy Wu shout out to the friend of the program. He had that Anthony black hot take going really early in the beginning Mm -hmm. of the year. to someone like Houston. And then the more I watch Anthony black, the more I continue to just find some area that I'm, I'm intrigued with and impressed with. And if you need to buy your buy stock on Anthony black, go watch him in the beginning of the year at the Maui invitational. I mean, he had a two game stretch where he just looked like a freak of nature. I mean, he was cooking with confidence. And if you can find that player on a more consistent level, that's a dangerous, dangerous weapon. All right, uh, moving on to the next grouping. We had Jet Howard at 11, Kaysen Wallace at 12, Kobe Bufkin at 13, Bryce Sensabaugh at 14, and Jordan Hawkins at 15. I can already hear everyone groaning about Jet Howard at 11, but I, I think it's important to remember the wide range that we have on all these consensus big boards that everyone at No Ceiling submits. And this is the average of yeah. coming down. And, and a lot of people still have Jet in the lottery. And I, I know there's been, throughout this whole draft cycle, he's been the name that seems to cool off a little bit when you talk around. But there's still some people around that buy in on him. Um, I think teams are going to look at what he was doing before he got injured and the fact that he was playing injured and his size, his skill set, I'm just still buying. Um, I had him at 15. I moved him down a little bit, but I think that's the point where I would see tremendous value if I was getting him like right outside the lottery or even late lottery. 
Yeah, I mean, out of this grouping, it surprised me that he was still this high. Um, I've moved him down to 13. So I, again, similar stance as you. I still really like him. I think there's so much overreaction going on with him and how he ended the year and how much his game changed because of the injuries. And I don't think people are really factoring that in. I thought what he showed on offense this year, especially that first half, first two thirds of the season was incredible and way more than we anticipated coming out of IMG. Um, so you get him healthy. That shot starts to look like what it did at the beginning of the year. The passing's still there, the off ball movement, the off ball creation. I think there's still so much to like. It really surprised me that he was at 11. Um, the Michigan guy that I am even a little higher on that. Um, all right. I'm just going to come on and say it. I had Kobe Buffkin at seven. Um, I love it. I love it. You've been, that? no, it's not. Um, here's the thing where everyone like, so he was at no ceilings. He's 13. We just mentioned that. Um, and me and you've talked about Buffkin a lot. And I've talked to a lot of people around the league about Buffkin. Everyone just keeps saying the same thing. I like him, I like him yeah. a lot. And it's just funny because it, he's the guy that I think everyone's like, I really like him, but no one wants to take that leap of faith of just being like, I'm all in, I'm all in on Buffkin. And here's the thing. Like I just, I wrote this week also a piece about Buffkin at noceilingsmedia.com. Go check it out. And I loved writing that piece because I looked at his splits throughout the year and it's it insane. is insane. When the light switch came on, it is just the biggest jump and it, stayed consistent throughout the year and you see like this stretch he started rebounding the crap out of the ball this stretch he started shooting lights out from three and all those stretches he's shooting like mid to high 80 percent from the line he's toying with 40 percent from three um and then i talked to you yesterday we um when i was writing my anthony black piece i was like have you seen Buffkin's at the rim numbers? They're absurd. It's like 70%. 71% overall and like 67% in the half court. That's absurd. So here's what I always do with a prospect that I'm in the same conversation as you. I, I had him at 14 and I was like, why am I not moving him up to like 10? Like, I was just like, I love him. But when you're enamored with a prospect like this, you go look at that's when you should go to analytics to try to back up what you're thinking. Like, I don't think you should ever lean on that, but analytics should be like the icing on top of the cake. And when you go look at Buffkin's numbers, you get really excited. You're like, Whoa. Okay. So, um, and I keep going back to this with everyone. Like we thought he was six, four, he measured six, four and a quarter at the combine barefoot just came out with a photo of him working out with uh, SGA of the Thunder. They look like they were the same size. Yep. SGA is 6'6". Six, six. Like you made a great point to mention that. So now we're getting something like big size combo guard. I, I, I think there's a shot he goes ninth to Utah. Like I think that's the like whoa out of nowhere. I, I mean we talked about that at our Utah Jazz piece on on the site. Like I, I love him. I don't think it's that crazy. I, I really do think he's shown that he deserves that and he's not going to be 20 until september i think off the top of my head a lot of upside yeah and i i promise that my infatuation with him is not just because i'm a michigan fan i just before people come at me with that um i you been... mentioned him in the beginning of the year before he even started like playing or putting up numbers like people go back on the podcast and say you you were saying kobe buffkin's a guy i really like i think he's Dalen Terry. That's exactly what the phrase you use. He said, I think he's going to be this year's Dalen Terry. And I was like, what? And then I watched him. And I was like, oh my gosh. So the ones and, that have and, been and, with us know it. And, and then his offense exploded into a whole nother level. Um, the other name on here that I guess caught me a little off guard, but he also might be one of the most polarizing prospects um, among the no ceilings crew is Bryce Sensabaugh at 14. Um, where are you at with Bryce? Um, I had him at 19, um, moved him up a little bit. And then I moved him. I just moved him down a couple spots. He's going to be really interesting. It seems like the buzz is almost kind of cooling right now on sensible around. I think some people are fans. I think it's going to be interesting to see if some stuff comes out next couple of weeks. I think the, the knee from high school maybe has been something that people are a little looking at. Um, 
I don't know. It, it's just been like everyone I'm asking around, I feel like is kind of almost buzzing about that. I don't know. We'll see. I, I'm, I will say to everyone listening to this, the next week and then the week of the draft is when we're going to start getting some serious smoke yeah. coming around these parts. Like that's, it's always that time of, you know, when we get to that 10 days remaining, like see things are going to start leaking a little bit and we're going to really start getting some stuff. So take everything with a grain of salt, be careful of what you believe. Sometimes stuff leaks around that time on purpose. Like, um, but I like sense ball. I think, We've said it for a long time, Metcalf. I think the later he goes, I think the better shot that Sensible has of yeah. being a really good NBA player. Because I just think his, you put him with better talent, he's going to be more impactful. And it, it, it's not that I am don't think he's a good player. I just think if you can have a, a really good starting lineup and you're bringing Sensible in as kind of a kicker, that is another dangerous weapon to add. But if you're putting him in a team and you're like, we need to force feed you the ball and you need to go create on your own. I don't know. I mean, he's very tough shot maker, but yeah. I've just, I have some questions about the defense. You. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've moved, moved him down to 25 at this point. Um, I had him as high as like 17 at one point. Um, but I just kind of keep going back to the lack of playmaking, uh, the lack of defense, and so, so some of the concerns that we started to hear. And he's just not my cup of tea as a player. He's he's an insane shooter. I think he's one of the best shooters in this class. Insane, tough shot maker. Um, I'm just worried about how well it translates. And if he's a guy I miss on, then so be it. Uh, but... Moving on to the next group, at 16, we had Jalen Huchafino, 17, Bilal Koulibaly, 18, Grady Dick, 19, Derek Lively, and 20, Max Lewis. I thought this range made me proud. Um, and what I mean by that is Bilal Koulibaly is the hottest name in the world right now. Yep. He's even bigger than Baby Gronk. Um, and... Everyone wants to talk about Koulibaly. I think there's, and just everyone remember this, big board rankings, just because he's at 17 on our no ceilings big board does not mean he can't go, you know, top 10 or in the lottery. It's just where we have him right now. I think there's a lot of fans I've asked around and, um, you know, Wasserman had a comment about there's rumors. Koulibaly has a, promise in the lottery i asked an executive i was like are you buying that he said nope and i was like that's an emphatic answer so um it's gonna be really interesting to see but i you can't deny the upside you can't deny the tools he has i think there's a lot of intrigue about if a team has multiple first i would probably not be surprised if that team tries to go snag him early um i think that's the holy crap curveball of utah at nine um, but I don't know. What about you? I, I, I just, it's really exciting, but yeah. And draft fans get so pumped up right this time of the year about a prospect, but you got to remember this. They're still playing. Everybody else isn't. So everyone gets to watch cool and Victor, and you're really enamored and this guy getting some, some buzz, but just because we're all, you know, head over heels for him as a prospect does not mean NBA teams are thinking the exact same way. Yeah. And I, I have him exactly at 17. So I'd like him in that kind of 12 to anywhere after that range. Um, I, I think his athleticism is awesome. I think he's could be one of the best wing defenders from this class. Mm -hmm. I'm still skeptical or not, not skeptical, hesitant to really buy in on the offense. Um, and it's really going to come down to the shot with him. He's still really reluctant. It's incredibly slow. Um, and there's really no pull-up threat with him at all because of how slow and reluctant that shot currently is for him. So I, I know the passing highlights are awesome with him where he'll, you know, thread a bounce pass to a cutter or, you know, make an awesome hit ahead. But then there are also some bewildering things where he throws it 30 feet over the guy's head or completely misreads the defender and throws it right into a defensive rotation. So it's weighing all of this 
okay, is he just having a really hot stretch to end the year? Or is this just building blocks and the accumulation of his development turning into a real thing? You know, the the answer is probably somewhere in between. But I, I still think that his offensive game, it has a lot more question marks than you know what people are kind of portraying him as based on these last couple games to end the season i and i have to give a shout out for everyone if you're looking for an in-depth piece on cool ball a um our own nathan grubel aka draft deeper he's gonna have one coming up soon on our site and i know yeah. nathan's working his butt off on that so it's i'm excited awesome. for that it's gonna be great um the thing with him is I think you're getting really excited about the building blocks of development. Like you're saying, like he has great footwork in transition when it comes to like his Euro step, that's his bread and butter. He's a vicious slasher when it comes to finishing around the basket. He has the athleticism. Um, I've liked some of the playmaking. The defense is really there. So there's some really good building blocks to start with, but now you need the rest of the game. Like he needs to kind of develop, more of a mid-range game. I think he's shown flashes of it at the lower level. With the senior team, I think he's been more of that slasher, f- potential catch-and-shoot guy, good defender. So um, raw ball of clay with really serious tools to develop. It's just which team is going to invest in being patient with him. Um, anybody yeah, that- else? Oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, just just to wrap it up on Kulabali. Yeah. I mean, you, you talked about his kind of at-rim stuff. I mean, he... In the half court this year, he shot 66% at the rim. That's insane. Yes. With that size, with that length, that athleticism, that's a real tool to carry forward. He also shot 36.4% off the catch, which I, I think in the long run, the spot of jumper will be a tool for him, or at least something that teams will have to respect. And if he shoots it at a 36% clip in the pros, that will be something where defenders will at least have to close out on him. And then that's what creates those driving lanes for him to attack closeouts and then create it around the rim. But then you look at the pull-up stuff, 7.7% on 13 attempts, incredibly low volume with incredibly poor results. So maybe that 7.7% is just a symptom of that minuscule sample size. But the fact that he was unwilling to take really any pull-up jumpers in the half court, I think that just raises a lot of questions. And if this is a wing that we're talking about doesn't really have any on-ball creation to his game, and he's purely a 3 and D guy, that's where I get skeptical about some people talking about him with the 8th, ninth pick. I don't know. It, after that, love it. Take a, take a big swing on it. But maybe, again, maybe it goes back to maybe he's just really early in this developmental curve, and it's something that he just isn't comfortable showing in games. But two years from now, it's a real tool. So he'll be one of the more fascinating case studies, I think. Yeah, I, I think I think there's still a shot in which he goes later than everyone might be expecting right now. And um, another name we just mentioned, I think Jalen Hutchifino is starting to get yeah. a little bit of momentum back um, in his favor. So I've heard he's looked good at workouts. I think the size is still going to be very enticing to teams because I think when you get if teams are looking at Anthony Black and they're very excited and they can't get Anthony Black, Hutchfino's going to be right next in that line of like, well, we might be able to get Hutchfino, who's kind of in the same ballpark of good size ball handler with upside on both sides of the ball. Um, so I think he's making a little bit of momentum back up. So um, that's that's the only other name I had, unless you got something. Uh, just real quick on Derek Lively. I yep. think he could be a guy that ends up going lottery. Um, Me too. Uh, he he also just had an incredible quote uh, to Hoops Hype um, today or recently where he uh, described himself. He said, I'd definitely say Willie Cauley-Stein, and you've got aspects of Anthony Davis's game and Hakeem Olajuwon's game. So just full spectrum there. Yeah, the, the levels of that quote, um, I hope he becomes a Hall of Famer because we need to probably <laughs> print that on a, a shirt. Um Anytime you can compare yourself to Hakeem. The, I mean, he had and the Will, dream and shake. Willie Stein and the, yeah, Willie uh, Cauley Stein. Trill, tr- trill, right? Um, I think Lively's got, he's getting some good momentum. He's going to be another one that's fascinating. I know he's getting mocked a lot to Dallas at 10, OKC I at like 12. What? I like the Dallas one a lot. I like Dallas a lot. Um, 10 is a little rich, though. 
Yeah, I know. I think Rafael Barlow, shout out Rafael, has been kind of pumping that one. I know a lot of people are trying to say maybe he goes 12 to OKC and kind of pair him with Chet. I don't know. Well, it'll be interesting to see. All right. Uh, moving on, we have Colby Jones at 21, James Najee at 22, Chris Murray at 23, Gigi Jackson at 24, and Marcus Sasser at 25. Um, Where do I start here? Colby, I'm very high on, so um, I got a little aggressive and put him at 13. There you love go. It. There's your sound bite to everyone. I love his game. I think he's a versatile asset that's going to get drafted later than he deserves. I think he's got great defensive ability. There's my sales pitch. I, I, I was pretty good with everybody else. I think Gigi's getting some buzz in the wrong direction. Um, I've been shocked to see how many other mainstream sites are um, putting him almost in the second round. A little yeah. shocked. Um, and when that happens, I almost flip a script and I'm like, I'm rooting for you. Let's go. <laughs> like someone take him. And so I think he's got too much talent to go that late, but yeah, I, he's one of those guys where it's like, you get to a certain spot in the draft and it's like, let's take the lottery ticket. If, if he, if he turns out, we look like geniuses and our, franchise is overachieving for the next 10 years if he doesn't then you know it's like okay well how many first round picks after 20 don't end up hitting anyways and it's like the 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 risk reward there um just doesn't make sense with him going all the way into the second round i agree i mean, i i completely agree um you know it, it's just it's just shocking it sends a statement um yeah when you see that mocked multiple places um and I, I'm right there with you. I think if you have multiple firsts, and there's a lot of teams that do have multiple firsts, I think there's too much talent there to not roll the dice, especially if you get your guy early on and you feel comfortable about being like, okay, let's, we got our guy that we feel really good about. Now let's, you know, we're at the craps table. Let's go all in and try to maybe get, get gold with this roll the dice. So um, I still think Gigi's got, I think Gigi understands the the incident with the Instagram live, all that stuff. And I think he's so young. I think yeah. he's going to work hard. I think someone's going to buy into like, okay, let's give this kid a shot. We, we got a good project here. And he might not even be much of a project early on because I think he's going to be motivated. Yeah. I and certainly hope so. Um, Colby Jones is a guy at a couple spots higher. Uh, James Najee. I had at that exact spot. I think he, I kind of think he goes top 20. I think he's going to surprise a lot of people. Me too. Um, Chris Murray, I'm a little lower on. Still have him in the first round. But I, th I think when we do a redraft, he's probably one of, going to be one of these guys that uh, returns top 20 value. But I think there's upside in other spots that I'd be willing, more willing to swing on. Um, and then Marcus Sasser kind of surprised me. Um, I really like Marcus Sasser. But I was surprised that we still had him 25 um, and – given that he's a six, two guard, uh, I, you know, maybe there's some Gabe Vincent vibes with his potential. We've seen how strong and how effective Gabe Vincent has been. I really like Marcus, Sass Marcus Sasser's game, but it, it did surprise me that the, the composite had him all the way up to 25. I mean, video came out today of Najee working out with Serge Ibaka, which I could not enjoy that pairing more. <laughs> so, um, I think I'm, I'm right there with you. It won't shock me if he goes top 20. There's the hot take for everyone. Um, we've been pumping that for a while. That's kind of the vibe I heard. Is there are a lot of fans around the league. Um, Sasser, I'm right there with you. It, it, Sasser is one of those, I, I think, teams are going to be to some point in the first round where they're going to be very comfortable with being like, this is a good value pick of getting someone like Sasser at this. If you buy in. Um, so... But I'm right there with you. I thought he might have been a little lower, and I was uh, pleasantly surprised. I was like, okay, I, you know, because I had moved him down a couple bit spots, but um, seeing him at 25, I was like, all right, and and I get it. There's just yeah. a lot to like with Sasser if you believe yes. he's going to be able to stick. That's a good value if you could get him at the almost the tail end of the first round. All right. Um, at 26, we had Nick Smith, 27, Leonard Miller, 28, C.D. Sissoko, 29, Derek Whitehead, and 30, Trace Jackson Davis. What a stretch. This might take an hour. <laughs> um, 
And and all, to be serious about these guys, I like all of these guys. It's just this is the little bit of a wild card stretch. Um, I think Nick's got but Nick's got lottery buzz, and Which... it's very. It's not. Remember, everyone, we're never rooting against these guys. No. It's just very interesting. Like everyone you talk to is like Lotto Buzz is real. Lotto Buzz is real. So that tells me that teams are going off of the the groundwork that he's shown before his year at Arkansas. And team, like I've, I talked to an exec about it. I asked him, and he's like. I asked him about the same thing. I was like, how do you evaluate a guy that had the one and done year that just didn't pan out the way that he thought it was going to be? He's like, you got to really trust the, the, what he's shown before then you got to trust the kid. You got to trust the character, the intangibles. Is he a hard worker? Like you got to go down the line. And I think Nick Smith is going to, has been checking all those boxes, Yeah, which means teams are going to keep believing in it. And, um, you know, we're saying lotto buzz. I think that's going to be towards the tail end of the lotto, which, mm-hmm. you know, maybe a team like New Orleans or, or or someone right around that range is buying in as a, let's bring him in. He doesn't have to be the guy right away. We can slow things down, let him catch his, you know, get his feet under him. And then he's still got one of the prettiest shots in this class. I, I, I think if he played a full year and didn't have those injury concerns, I think he would have ended up around 40% from three. So um, we have him lower, but we're probably still going off of what we just watched. And I think there's also some guys at no ceilings that weren't overly impressed by the high school stuff. So we're rooting. It would be awesome if he becomes a star I want because so I'd be like lesson learned like all right I you know I need to lean more on that or we're always trying to get better but from what I saw at Arkansas I thought he was constantly sped up looked like he was a guy that got all this preseason buzz that was trying to get healthy and show that he was yeah. worth it and I think the system was also a bit of a nightmare when it came to like they didn't have a lot of floor spacing no um and I I'm sorry for diehard Razorback fans, but like Ricky council wasn't spacing the floor consistently. Like defenses weren't going to be like, Oh crap, Ricky shooting threes. Anthony black wasn't trying to shoot threes whenever he could. I mean, I think he averaged around less than three attempts a game from downtown. So, um, it was a crowded lane and Nick Smith, they were basically relying on to be their sharpshooter. So that's all I got. Sorry. A little, little vent there. No, I, <laughs> He's one of the guys I've struggled with the most where beginning of the year I had him top 10 and I kind of clung to that for a long time because of the injury. And I always want to give guys benefit of the doubt with that and give them time to kind of get back um, and get healthy. But then the on-court stuff at Arkansas, it was bad. It was just flat out bad. And at one point I had him almost at 40 on my board. Uh, Currently I have him at 24. So I'm just running the emotional gambit with him. Um, What I kind of keep going back to the, to though is what you were talking about with the intangibles um and entire season he was trying to get back from injury even when he wasn't 100 percent, he was coming back um he's he was an awful defender and maybe one of the worst in this class but it was never because of lack of effort like even you know he would get down in a stance he would try to keep up with the guys he would chase him off ball he would the effort was there he just had no idea what he was doing so is there something where maybe we he can get coached up into at least below average or average levels? I don't think he'll ever be a great defender, but I think he's got decent length and the work ethic is there. So what does that mean for what he can grow into? I'm still not sold that he's this super dynamic offensive creator um, like I was hoping for coming out of high school. I didn't love his high school stuff. I thought it was good, not great. I thought it got overblown. Um, and what you said about him as an on-ball creator playing sped up, he played at one speed all season and not in a good way. Everything looked hurried. Everything looked rushed. Everything was frantic. I think he's going to shoot it, but it's everything else in his game where I'm like, okay, this is a really big question mark. But then I go back to the work ethic, the intangibles, the give a damn factor. And it all seems to be there. So it's like, I, at some point, 
I can't completely sell everything with him. And I, I, I also can't, I also can't completely buy in because of how inefficient and ineffective the tape was. Yeah. He looked at times this year, he looked like a sports car that the brakes went out. Like he just couldn't slow down. Like it, it was just one of those things where I, I, and we talked about this before Derek Whitehead, another guy we just mentioned had a quote when he came back from his injury after a game. And he said, everything's moving so fast. I'm yeah. just trying to get caught up. I'm just trying to have things slow down. And I think that's something we all have to remember with these freshman guys that especially when you're coming back from an injury that you've missed some time, you're trying to get back and be like, okay, like I'm supposed to be this stud player. And um, I I'm rooting for Nick Smith. I think the kid just needs some confidence. I'm, Hoping he gets drafted and his first summer league game, he has 25 points and looks fantastic. I'll be like, yes, but I had him at 26 on my board. We had him at 26 and no ceilings. Um, I think that was a, a, a range in which it makes sense because it shows the uncertainty. Like some people are buying, some people are a little lower. We're kind of in wait and see mode. Um, who else, who else do you thought? I think Leonard Miller is going to catch some attention from some people listening. Um, we had him at 27. I still think he's the the mystery man of this draft. Fit's going to be fantastic. I think he's going to go a lot earlier than this. For I do what too. It's worth. I do too. I really do. And I just we keep saying all the time for everyone listening, we don't know where the fit is. And yeah. um, Buzz has been all over the place, um, both sides. So that doesn't help us at all. <laughs> <laughs> it just makes it more challenging. Yeah. Um, hey, 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 leakers, can you be a little more helpful with yes. uh, what so, you're feeding us? I, I mean, I've I've asked some people that said the league's lower than the public. Yeah. Um, I, I've and I wasn't shocked to get that. I was like, that makes sense. And um, yeah, we, we've I'm heard pretty, we've heard that the shooting and workouts has been rough. The athleticism has been incredible. And yeah. So. That's what I, and I saw that in person when I saw right. him play in the beginning of the year, I was like, gosh, he's a freak athlete. He's right. lengthy as lines heck up with the tape. and it lines up, but it's just the shot. Can it come around? Um, so yeah, I, I mean, Look, anything on Derek or city or we, we got to talk about Derek. just had another foot surgery. So um, I think that was or, just the, the one that was expected, Okay, but it was very questionable wording. Cause it made me the, when I read it first, I was like, Oh, he had another one. And I think it was, they announced it a couple months ago that he was going to have this one and he just had it. But if I'm wrong, people can message me and let me know. But I, I feel like I read it and I was like, wait, no, this was expected. This was a weird headline. Cause I thought he had another one. And okay. I think this is the one that was planned all along, but that's, that's a little more encouraging, I guess. He's, maybe <laughs> He's been meeting with teams in the lottery. Apparently he's been meeting with teams that have multiple firsts. That makes some sense to me. That makes some sense if you have multiple first to go. One of your swings is Dariq Whitehead. So wh- Utah. <laughs> where, where, where are you at with Dariq? Because he he kind of falls into the same bucket as Nick Smith, where where it's how much are you buying the pre college tape? And you know, I this episode is going up on Friday, and my Jarris Walker piece on his playmaking is also out right now over at NoSeelingsNBA.com, and that's kind of a big premise of it is. In high school, he showed a lot more on offense than he was allowed to at Houston. I think we saw the same thing from Derek and Nick Smith. So are you chalking up this whole last year for Derek as injury, couldn't get back in shape, speed of the game, wasn't able to find a role, all that kind of stuff? Or do you just think it's he's kind of a bit player? I'm leaning towards the injury. And um, where do you have him? I have him at 25. Okay. I I actually I have him ahead of Nick Smith because Same. I'm I'm buying the outside shot coming around in the way it did this year. If if his explosiveness comes back and he has that now, well, like you, you know, we were I had him. I think me and you both had him preseason he was, top ten. He was three for me coming in. Yeah, I think year. I had him like top six. I loved him. I never saw, I think I saw once this year, his defense looked like I thought it was going to, when it came to like just nastiness. And in high school, I saw that nastiness. Um, I think he was a guy that looked, he looked like he was at 60% at best 
when he, this year, when it came to his yeah. health and I just never saw that burst. So I'm having him at 25 thinking he's going to get healthy. Some team's going to draft him and say the first year is like, we're just getting you healthy and you're going to get some confidence and we're going to think big picture long-term here. And if all of that comes around and the outside shot is now consistent, I think you're going to get potentially gold with where he ends up in the draft. Now I'm not saying if you draft him at 26, he's going to be a top 10 player in a redraft four years from now, but you might get, you know, Oh, he was a top 14 guy, which if you're getting him late first round, that's fantastic. So I just can't get over the idea of like, okay, the, the outside shot was something I needed to see develop. It did in a huge way. He shot 42% from three. And if everything comes back and he can get healthy, I think those worlds combine and there's a heck of a basketball player that's just going to be unleashed. I'm rooting for him. I really am. Yeah, and I, I still have him at 20. I just, the pre-college stuff combined with the huge shooting improvement despite the injury that we saw this year, I just, I can't sell all of my stuff right. with him. And, you know, it's like he's kind of in that that range where it's like worst case scenario with him. I kind of view as like a Max Struess outcome. And that's a really good player. That's a top six, seven guy in a rotation on a finals team. If he can hit that as a bare minimum, I, I think that's worth a top 25 pick, uh, top 20 pick even. Um, all right, let's move on to the second round. So at 31, we have Julian Strother, 32, Jaime Jaquez, 33, Brandon Pajemski, 34, Ryan Rupert, 35, Noah Clowney, 36, Julian Phillips, 37, Bobby Clintman, 38, Terquavion Smith, 39, Ben Shepard, 40, Olivier Maxence Prosper. Okay, a lot of names to take in here. Jaquez has been the popular name. Mm -hmm. um, have heard he has been very good in workouts. Um, I think we're at the point where I would not be shocked if he's going first round. Um trying to think of who else here bobby clintman's obviously had some rumblings of a little bit of a promise we'll be interested to see um and then ben shepherd i feel like you know that's another name this is where we're talking we've talked all year the range is going to be crazy because we have ben shepherd at 39 i could see him going into the first round you know we have homie hockey as a 32 i could see him going mid-20s um it's crazy. Pajemski at 33. I could see him either going late first or, you know, later second. Or I'm I mean later 30s, like high 30s. I don't know. It's just wide range. And and a lot of these names right here I think could go anywhere and could sneak into the first or they could go later. Yeah, and the the two guys that I'm that I have way higher are Julian Strother and Julian Phillips, uh, both of who, whom I have in my top 26. I have Strother at 23, Julian Phillips at 26. Um, I I just I, – I, I think Julian Strother is – I would be shocked if he doesn't return first round uh, production. I think he's too good of a shooter, too good of a rebounder. Um, and I, I think people are really overthinking um, his – De the the questions about his defense and athleticism. I, I think he's just going to be one of these upperclassmen who comes in and produces very quickly. And then Julian Phillips, I just, I can't get over the idea that Rick Barnes completely neutered his offense this year and just didn't allow him to show anything that he showed in high school. I really think there's OG and an OB upside with him. Um, and I think if you can get him in the mid to late twenties, that'd be an absolute steal. I saw a mock of Strasser going at the end of the second. And if that oh. actually happened in real life, I'd flip a desk and probably be the most upset person ever. One, because I like him. And two, because that means the Celtics passed on him. But <laughs> I love Strasser. I think he's going to be a, a great pick. Um, Rupert is the name I'm continuing to believe is going to go in the first round. I don't know where it's going to be. I think someone's going to take him. Um, I'm not shocked that the public or a lot of draft evaluators that I respect out there are lower on him. I just am looking at this from a tools and what NBA teams are going to think of them. And I think repair, it would not shock me if he still goes in the first round. So, um, but yeah, I'm right there with you with Phillips. 
Um, just, damn just, you, Rick Barnes. Damn you. I'm kidding. Uh, just real quick on Omax Prosper. Um, yeah. It, it kind of surprised me that we still had him at 40, given the buzz and how mm-hmm. much he exploded at the combine and how much NBA teams are reportedly in love with him um, and how a lot of different outlets are now mocking him in the first round. Um, were you surprised at all by that? Um, I still have him at 39, so he moved up a little bit for me, but I still not completely buying the shot. I'm not completely buying the offensive production. Um, so it was kind of encouraging to see the group not fully buy into the recency stuff. Um, where are you at with him? Yeah, I was proud of the new ceilings crew. I, I mean, I mean that I think a lot of people try to overreact and jump up and our guys have been doing their homework all year. Like this, you know, everyone we've, <laughs> the draft deeper guys were probably talking about prosper three months ago. It's just one of those things where like, it's, we're always talking, we're bringing up anyone. So I think everyone's been familiar and the smart thing about scouting is like, you know, it's never late to change your mind, but I also think it's smart to be like, okay, he looked really good at the combine. Let's go back and reevaluate. And I think that's what everyone on our team did. And I had him at 38. Um, so, you know, I had him at 38, you had him at 39, and the, the team put him at 40. I, I feel pretty good about that. And um, I do think he's a guy that could go into the first round. I, I, everyone's going to be getting a headache because we were saying that about a lot of guys, but that's yeah. the truth this year. You hear so many names. So a um, lot of intriguing tools, kind of a hot name with creating some momentum. Um, but that doesn't always mean that you're going to go – you know, top 23 because you had a great process or a pre-draft process. Sometimes that can lead to, Oh, you were a late second round guy to all of a sudden now you're might be early second round and, and, you know, or a priority guy that teams trade up in the second round to get you or late first round. So I think he's got a lot of tools and a lot of momentum going for him, but um, you know, I like that. We didn't overreact. All right, uh, at 41, friend of the program, Jalen Clark, 42, Jordan Walsh, 43, Amari Bailey, 44, Andre Jackson, 45, Nikola Jurisic, 46, Adama Sanogo, 47, Isaiah Wong, 48, Seth Lundy, 49, Mike Miles, and 50, Kobe Brown. You pick where you want to start. Um, let's talk about the Jordan Walsh buzz. Um, are you buying in? I have him at 44, so he moved up a little bit for me. Um, I think the defense is very real. The athleticism is very real. I think there's even some really intriguing passing stuff to his game. Again, with these types of players, it's going to come down to the shot and I don't buy it at all. I don't think he's really ever had a history of shooting it. So this lack, the lack of volume, the lack of efficiency this year, I don't think is a surprise or an outlier. So I hope he gets there. I hope he proves me wrong again, like with all these guys I'm lower on. But when I start seeing him go near first round, I, I struggle to kind of understand the value in that. Um, I had him at 40. Um, I, I get the intrigue. There's a lot of stuff that checks boxes that you could get really excited about. If you think you can develop those raw areas of his game, I understand why he's a very exciting piece to potentially get at some point of the very late first round to early second round i think you'd be like okay yeah we might have something here um but like i i like jalen clark more than him and everyone could roll their eyes at me but like jalen clark you know averaged 2.6 steals a game he was a menace on the defensive side of the ball all year i think he actually has the skill set to contribute early on Um, and he's further along now, obviously he's a little older than Walsh. Walsh was a freshman, but I still would have more confidence in Jalen Clark's ability right now. Um, and and I had Clark at 35. I've kind of just been enamored with him as a defender. And I think he's a willing cutter. He, He checks a lot of boxes for me and Jordan Walsh could definitely get to a point where he has more value or upside than Clark, but I, you know, I, I at least buy Jalen Clark being kind of a respectable outside shooter. Um, I know it's been a while for him to develop that, yeah. but Walsh, I have questions and 
Um, is Walsh that dominant of a defender in which the outside shot, you know, you ignore? I don't know if we're there with that. And I, he is a very good defender, but mm -hmm. we saw that in the tournament. But I think there's other guys in this class that might offer the potential to be like, well, he's in the same conversation defensive wise, but this guy can shoot it a little bit, or this guy can at least impact the, the game offensively in a number of different ways. So I don't know. Um, the only other name that kind of stood out to me in this grouping was Adama Sonogo, um, who I had at almost the exact same spot. Um, I'm a little frustrated with myself that I let a lot of people talk me out of Sonogo earlier in the year. And talk, just, talk to me about Sonogo or, or give everyone the sales pitch about Sonogo. Like, what do you love I, about him? The, I, I think the scoring touch is very, very real. And, um, just the, the pick and pop jumper, the outside shot, um, obviously he's not some dynamic shooter, but from just a pick and pop, let it fly from the top of the arc type of three. I, I think it, the, the improvements that he made this year were very real. And that also translated into his post scoring and his floater. I thought he had a really good floater this year. Then you add on that. He's just an absolute menace on the boards. Obviously we're not talking about some all-star center here that you're going with, but as a backup or you're the third center in your rotation, I think he just provides a lot of the dirty work and kind of offensive versatility that is going to find a role in the league. Love it. I love it. I think um, the only other name I would say in here is Amari Bailey, who I have later, but um, I know some people have said he's got first round buzz. I don't know I if don't I'm buy buying it, um, but yeah, that's the only ones I have. If you, Kobe Brown at 50, I think it's going to go earlier because um, he's just someone's buying into all that versatility and he's, his numbers are so impressive. I've been, I've been, I'm going to pump out these graphics um, when it comes to like stats from our big board and stuff, but like he's got an effective field goal percentage of 62.5. He has freakish numbers across the board and, and they're kind of up there with some of the best from his position. So I just could see someone buying in on drafting him earlier because of everything he can do on the court. Like he might not be elite at anything, but he does a ton of stuff good, which if you're getting that in the second round, you're probably feeling pretty good. You just got to have to have a really good place for him. And, you know, that's a guy that somehow goes to like Miami and becomes the sixth guy in the rotation and drives me crazy for years. But I, I just like his game. It's going to be interesting for me. All right. Um, at 51, we had Ricky Council, the fourth, 52, Jalen Wilson, 53, Demoy Hodge, 54, Jordan Miller, 55, Muhammad Gay, uh, 56, Keontae Johnson, 57, Tumani Kamara, 58, Azulis Tubelis, 59, Jalen Slauson, and 60, Colin Castleton. Really interesting range of guys that I think could go all over the place. Um, I'm a little, I mean, I, the Jalen Wilson lower buzz from everyone's been really interesting to watch this whole year. Um, I'm going to be fascinated to see how the NBA views him. Um, I like Demoy Hodge a lot. I love Jordan Miller. I absolutely think he's going to be great value. Well, the, the one that was really interesting to me was that our consensus board, everyone was still buying to Bellis. Um, cause I feel like he's been very cooled off this whole process. I haven't really heard any buzz about him. I feel like combine, he didn't really pop and I don't know. What, what, what did you think? Thoughts? Um, I've kind of been out on Tubelis all year. Uh, he's been in that That's kind of thief six... of joy. <laughs> <laughs> You're a thief of joy. No, I, I get it. it. He's just in a weird tweener position, but I think. He's the top 60 guy in my... And I've, I've met 62, so it's not like there's some drastic difference, yeah. but he's kind of been in like that 65 range for me all year. Um, I'm not sure I'd spend draft capital on him, but if he's if I need a big and I have a two-way open or, you know, he, he's probably one of the first um, guys I'm calling as a UD, U, UDFA. Um, but like when you look at him and a guy like uh, Tosin... If, Boom one. Apologies on the pronunciation there. I know I just butchered the last name, uh, but Tosin from Princeton, I would lean towards Tosin. Yeah, it's 
I mean, we talked about him too. I liked him a lot. Um, there's just some names in that range that probably are going to make it an interesting decision with if teams are looking at Tubelas. Like, I've been cooler on Muhammad Gay all year, and then I just watched him in, against USC, and I was like, this was a terrible decision because he looked fantastic. Yeah. And, Welcome um, to the top 10. Yeah, well, it was just that game. It's just like, whoa. Yeah. But I saw him in person, and I was like, eh, I'm kind of out. And then I watched him more, and I was like, oh, man, I get it. So I think he's getting drafted. I think Jalen Slauson's probably a name that could go earlier. Um, I think I saw a report that New Orleans brought him in for a private workout, which is very interesting when you're bringing in – you know, guys like that. I like his game a lot. When I watched him, I was like, well, I really like Sawson, but um, I think he's going to be a guy that teams are going to be like, he looks better with five on five than he was going to look in like a workout setting. You know, he's a gamer though. Um, and I like that. We had Castleton at 60. I think he's yeah. super sleeper for a big man. Um, the, uh, I, I still have Mojave King in my top 60. He didn't make it a uh, couple names right outside the top 60 for me. Um, I'm still intrigued by Jacob Toppin, Adam Flagler. Uh, sounds like he's been working out pretty well. Um, Armand Franklin from Virginia is a guy that I'd still be calling uh, very quickly after the yes. draft ended. Uh, Jalen Pickett. Um, I think there's some interesting backup point guard stuff there. And then, I have no idea what's going to happen with Chris Livingston, but it's going to be fascinating. I think it was a shot he's drafted. Um, I love me and you both talking to you in the beginning of year. I love Livingston as a prospect. I just thought he had like the nightmare year at Kentucky. So it wouldn't shock me if teams are watching him in workouts and they're saying, this is what we saw in high school. And um, he looked great in some of those videos I've seen. He, I feel like he's got enough buzz. Um, Amari Moore of San Jose State's another name I'm kind of intrigued by. Um, but he might be a two way guy to start out. Um, so yeah, gonna be interesting. But I thought this, I really did think that no ceilings consensus looked good. I think the next one's gonna be interesting to see if anyone has any late things, but I think there just could be some movement. Um, you mentioned Jalen Pickett, I've heard Jalen Pickett's been kicking some ass too in workouts. So it's always fun this time of the year. You start getting some breadcrumbs. You start getting some names that have been, you know, looking good behind closed doors. And um, I'm excited. This There's a lot of really fun names. I'm just fascinated to see wherever they go. I, I, I really am. All right, Rucker. Um, I did not prep you for this, but I have a new nomination for the green room. Um, oh, wow. So we, on, we only have eight names in there. We got to get to 14. Um, Currently, the members are Victor Wembanyama, Jairus Walker, Scoot Henderson, Cam Whitmore, Amen Thompson, Brandon Miller, Asar Thompson, and Taylor Hendricks. Uh, for new listeners or those of you who may have forgotten, uh, the Green Room is the most prestigious cl club in the basketball community. Um, it is a direct ripoff of, of um, Amin El Hassan and Zach Harper's uh, Superstar Club. Um, there are 14 spots, and it's not just our lottery rankings. It's based on potential, on-court stuff, off-court stuff, vibes all that kind of, you know, it, it's very fluid. Um, but my, my nomination combo guard from Michigan, Mr. Kobe Bufkin. Yeah, he's in perfect. 100%. Do we need to, do we need to nominate another one because we're running short on time or what? Uh, we, we certainly can. Okay. So throw me a couple names because you just read off all the names. You've got them right in front of your face. I feel like everyone you mentioned, though, I was like, yes, 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 yes. Um, so I, I think a couple to take a look at. Um, Anthony Black, Keontae George, Kaysen Wallace, uh, Jordan Hawkins, Colby Jones. Um, I'll, I'll throw, I'll, I'll nominate Anthony Black. I think he belongs in there for good vibes alone. He's got some of the best hair we'll ever see. Looks like almost white Goodman. Shout out Dodgeball. Um, but it's got like the multicolor stuff. I, I think he's just, you know, an electric personality to have inside the green room. I think we, we got to have him. I would agree. Okay. So, okay. So we're up to 10. There are and we got to get to 14. Left. Do you, do you want to do another one today or save the final four for next, next time? No, let's, let's one more. And then we'll have the final three for next episode. Um, you get to nominate. 
Okay, I'm gonna throw. You got the names in front of you. I'm gonna go throw three names out. If you hate okay. all of them, produce your own. Um, I'm gonna uh, nominate Jordan Hawkins, Bilal Kulabali, and Colby Jones. The problem is, is those were the three names I was looking at. Is Keontae <laughs> in? No, not yet. No, gosh. Okay, this is gonna get tricky. Um. Kulabale. I'm not I'm not there with Kulabale. I okay. don't think he's in the green room yet. He's in line. He's like eighth in line. No, he's not eighth in line, but he's in line and he's hoping the bouncers don't cut him off and say nobody else can come in. Um Hawkins and Colby Jones. Oh man. <laughs> those are my those. I had them 12, 13, so this is really tough. Um, you, I, I, Both of them are good for me, so you pick one. Oh, boy. Um, they can't both get in because we have, you know, we're running out of spots. But um, I would say Jordan. Oh, why? <laughs> it, 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 does, no, the, I, I want to say Colby. Does the wanna... national title prestige put Jordan in because yes. he's walking in with the ring? Yes. But Perfect. he's also light on his feet, you know, probably tearing up the dance floor because he's just high movement guy. Um, he's bouncing around to every part of the club, taking shots all over the place. Yeah, jump shots. Not, you know, he's, he's you know, we don't want to get canceled. But, um, yeah, he's, he's, he's bouncing around. He's moving around, making sure everyone's doing good. Um, just won the title. So, you know, he walked in with the trophy. They didn't even have to have him in line. He just got in right in way. I think that's a good one. Perfect. <sighs> Colby Jones though. Well, he, no, he might, he might be online. We'll put him for the next episode. We'll, we'll talk yeah. about it. So, I mean, our candidates gotta be Keontae, Colby Jones, Lively. I don't know. We're we'll have to think about James it. Najee. Najee's the bouncer. Kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> but that's all I got. That's all I got. We'll all figure right. it out. Rucker, this was a blast. Uh, plug away. Thanks, uh, everyone, for, for listening, watching. Thanks for the support with everything. We've got yeah. so much awesome feedback about the guide and everything we've been doing. It's been really cool this last month and change. And um, we've got a lot of big big pieces coming up at no ceilings NBA all the way until the draft. Um, Nick Caps Jairus Walker piece is probably one that I'm the most excited to read. I know Nathan's cool. Bali piece is going to be awesome. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to write a Victor piece that I haven't seen anyone do. So it's going to be Don't really challenging. Um, yeah. And we got a lot of other big names too. So um, I'm at Tyler underscore Rucker on Twitter. Message me. Let's talk draft. Let's talk hoops. Let's talk life. Um, thank you guys. As always, we love you. Well, once again, I'm Tyler Metcalf. You can follow me on Twitter at tmetcalf11. Uh, DMs are always open if you want a message on the side um, or talk in public. Game for whatever. Uh, you can find our merchandise, including our draft guide, at noceilingsnba.bigcartel.com. Uh, the draft guide is 10 bucks. A uh, lot of info in there. We've The feedback on it has been incredible. We appreciate all of you. Uh, we also have a lot of really cool merchandise over there from hoodies to T-shirts to hats. It all looks really cool. Um, all of our written work, you can find at no ceilings nba.com. It's a hundred percent free and publishes at least Monday through Friday. Uh, by the time you're listening to this, uh, my Jairus Walker piece, breaking down his playmaking, what it looked like in high school compared to Houston and how it could translate to the pros should be up there. So make sure to go check that out along with, uh, Rutgers, Anthony black piece that went up on Thursday. You can follow us across all socials at no ceilings NBA and on YouTube at no ceilings TV. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to subscribe, leave a review and five star rating till next time. See ya.